an ophthalmologist, and my husband Alistair is a dermatologist, both working in Vancouver. And so I have as、um, a topic today to tell you that we developed, we pioneered the cosmetic use of botulinum toxin, which most of you know as Botox. How many of you know Botox? Show of hands. Oh, everyone. And probably most of you think it's kind of a ugh, yucky, a sort of vanity drug. Maybe you think of it as a silver screen, starlets on a red carpet. Maybe, maybe you sort of are dismayed that people would do something so frivolous. So my job today is to teach you the bigger story of this amazing molecule. And to take you from where you're thinking of botulinum toxin as a terrible poison, and its transformation into a superb new multi-purpose drug. Now, would you believe me if I told you that this whole story began with sausages? <laughs> and they weren't even good sausages; they were bad sausages. <laughs> I want you to come back in time with me. I want you to come back to 1822. We're in Germany, and it's horrible. It's in the aftermath of the Napoleonic Wars. There's poverty. There's hunger, and people are still getting together. But most horrifyingly, they're actually starting to die of this unstoppable paralysis. Again and again, and it was terrifying to those people. Justinus Kerner was the German medical officer, and he actually was so horrified by this too. I am too, that he went and studied all of the outbreaks, and he came to the conclusion it was those darn sausages. That was the common factor, and he knew there was something awful in those sausages. But even in the midst of all that tragedy, he said, "I wonder if you could find out what that was. What's that little substance in those sausages? Maybe we could use it to treat humans who have overactive muscles." That's pretty bright in the middle of all that fear and panic. Now come back into 150 years, and we come. We're going from Germany to San Francisco. And in San Francisco is Dr. Alan Scott. He's another ophthalmologist, but he's a genius. And he was thinking, I need this great new idea to be able to treat people who have crossed eyes, misaligned eyes, and instead of doing surgery. What I want to do is to inject something delicately into those eye muscles so that the muscles will straighten the eyes. And he knew about Justinus Kerner. He knew that Justinus Kerner had even thought of a medical application for this disgusting poison, and so that was one of his choices. And he chose three other drugs because he said to me in an email he thought it was a little weird to just pick Justinus Kerner's molecule. But he did this monkey experiment, injecting eye muscles with tiny doses, billionths of a gram, of botulinum. And、uh, and the other three drugs, but the winner was the botulinum, because the monkeys got a predictable change in their eye alignment, and they were perfectly healthy. And so, being the superb scientist that he is, he's enormously credible. He applied for permission to use this medication on excuse me on humans, and so he was granted permission. And it was at that point. In 1982, that I arrived in San Francisco to be his academic fellow. He taught me how to do all the injections. He taught me so much about the anatomy, and I was aware, though, that as fascinating as it was, I was in a different world from a lot of the people out there, because I knew that Alan Scott, the genius, had worked out that we were using billionths of a gram. It's a drug. And they out there were still thinking about botulinum as a terrible poison. In fact, the most poisonous poison. 
So there was an air of, shall we say, controversy. And when I brought the idea back to Canada, and I applied to Health Canada to join Alan's multi-center worldwide trial of botulinum to treat misaligned eyes and also eye spasms, they granted it to me. Now, I slipped a new condition in. I haven't told you about eye spasms. Anybody know anyone who looks like this? Blinking, face, painful spasm of the neck. And this is called dystonia, but I'm going to call it eye spasms because that's really where we started. So these people can't live an independent life. So I'm going to share a story with you about Ed, one of my first dystonia patients, and it really moves me to think what happened. So he's, his dystonia, his eye spasms, have been getting worse and worse. He can't even get his eyes open now. He can't drive his car, he can't cross the street, he can't earn a living. And he was led into my office by his wife, his lovely wife. She was desperate too. And you can imagine his courage in allowing me to inject this shiny new idea of a drug into his facial muscles in order to relieve the spasm. Tremendous courage. So I treated him, and I got this letter three days later a thank you, and a picture of him driving his red convertible. Hey, how does that feel? That felt amazing because his face looked normal in the picture, his eyes were open, and he was happy again, leading an independent life. And we know what the treatments, the alternative treatments were, really to have surgery to pull out the branches of the facial nerve which can leave you with a face like that and eyes that don't close, which is quite a bad trade. So he was thrilled, I was thrilled, and more so, I was so enthused. And you know, the thing about these eye spasm patients is a lot of people didn't know what they had, but the eye spasm patients that I treated would go up to these people and say, excuse me, I know what you have, <laughs> and this is who you should go and see. And so there was a lot of patient referrals as well. So we got very busy with it. The second, the second patient I want to share with you is unusual because she was a severe eye spasm patient, but she got angry with me. She said, you didn't treat me here. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I would have treated you there, but I didn't think that you had any spasm. And she said, and listen to this, because you have to listen to your patients. I know I'm not spasming there, but every time you treat me there, I get this beautiful, untroubled expression. Now, I might have ignored that, except I'm married to Alistair. And Alistair, the dermatologist, had said, the treatment for these deep frown lines are really just not good at the moment. I can't seem to make anything really work for these patients. So I went home and I said, why don't we do a study with my botulinum and your wrinkle patients. So we decided to do it. Sounded logical, right? So we, we started a study. The first patient we treated was Kathy, who was our wonderful receptionist. Kathy... <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. She was knowledgeable. She'd sat there for four years. <laughs> She sat there for four years, and what she'd done was to check in all my eye spasm and eye alignment patients, and she'd seen that they were always on time, always polite, always grateful. Wouldn't you be if your eyes were opened again? So she said, sure, whatever. So, <laughs> so we treated her, and in three days, she got the same thing my blepharospasm patient, my eyelid spasm patient, had, had the smooth forehead, the elevated brow, and the refreshed, open, younger expression. So she thought it was really great. And then we started trying to enroll more people, and this is where we ran into a problem. You want to inject what? I heard of that. Isn't that a, isn't that a poison? Uh, there was just too big a gap 
between what we were offering and what they were able to accept. So we did the logical thing. We injected me. And if you look now, what do you think? I haven't frowned since 1987. <laughs> <laughs> so, we put the study together and we presented it in 1991 at the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery. <laughs> we were met with this hailstorm of disbelief, disapproval, incredulity. You're using that horrible poison on these wrinkle patients? What's wrong with you? But remember, I had now had eight years of experience in using this marvelous new drug on patients and, and really restoring their lives to them. So we decided that because of this credibility gap, we needed to do more research, more publications, more teaching, and gradually we got invited all around the world to give these talks how do you do it? Why do you do it? Where do you do it? Uh, what are the complications? You know the usual things in medicine. And gradually, all these people started publishing and teaching. And now we've got a movement, and it's around the world. And now, Botox has gone from, you want to inject what? Or, that's a crazy idea that will go nowhere. It's gone mainstream. Last year, six million cosmetic injections around the world. It's the number one cosmetic treatment in the world. And it is so mainstream now that it's a noun, it's a verb, it's an adjective. It's, it's really an amazing, amazing change in reputation. But it took 25 years of hard work. So this spring, we were humbled by being given the highest award the American Academy of Dermatology can give for innovation and also leadership. It's nice to be recognized while you're still alive. <laughs> so, shall we go back to the molecule? Because this is a molecule that's still giving us messages. The clearest message that we get from this molecule is, look again. And the second message we get is, look deeper. And the reason I'm so proud of the cosmetic indication and the cosmetic success is because you can't treat six million people in the world without having other doctors in other specialties notice. And there are a number of really interesting new uses, but there are now 25 government-approved indications in 85 countries around the world. That's enormously mainstream. So who are these other people who've now moved into the botulinum world? Well, what about the neurologists? They're treating spasticity, they're treating pain syndromes, they're treating MS, they have a particular interest in migraine. Now, migraine, how many of you have migraine? Yeah, there's so quite a few. So it's a miserable condition because you can't think through pain, and you have to take time off in order to recover. And that affects about one in eight of the North American population, costing the North American economy over $50 billion a year in lost income. So that's a pretty impressive new use. What about the dermatologists? They're already using it cosmetically, but what about the excessive sweating that stops people feeling comfortable about shaking hands or attending a meeting because they have to wear black? It's just a big pool of, of sweat. What about the orthopedic surgeons? They're starting to use it. And uh, what about the psychiatrists? The latest twist is that the psychiatrists are starting to use it to treat depression. That's 20% of the U.S. population. Interesting. So the thing that we did by establishing the cosmetic indication was actually to lay the framework out for other specialties to get into this whole idea. I mean, they're thinking, okay, I can use it to treat conditions I didn't actually know I could treat before. I want to thank those early patients. I want to acknowledge them for their bravery, 
for their trust. They're letting me inject them. And I just really, we wouldn't be anywhere where we are now if it wasn't for their incredible courage and, and, and belief. Now, what does the other message, the botulinum molecule, what does it tell us about how to cope with a new idea? Because new ideas, we've just had some fantastic presentations. New ideas are all amongst us. And the thing is with the botulinum molecule, it's easy to say, ah, oh, it's just a poison, and write it off. But it's a brand new idea, and we should really listen to a brand new idea, and we should look carefully at it. And we should then use our imaginations. Let's not forget to do that. And then we have to be prepared with our new idea, not to be afraid to put our shoulder to the wheel, to do the huge amount of work that's necessary to prove, excuse me, it was a lot of work, <laughs> to prove the worth of this indication to your peers. So I was thinking that this is, the botulinum story is actually a perfect example of this year's TED theme, which is confluence. A terrible poison transmutates into a superb new drug. And a couple of Canadian physicians educate lots and lots of people around the world for the health and well-being of millions. I thank you. <laughs>